Hi, welcome back to General Chemistry. My name is Chuck White, and today's lesson is on chemical bonding. Today we're going to talk about bonding and nomenclature. We'll talk about ionic and covalent bonds and how to name molecules and compounds. We'll talk about chemical composition, specifically percent mass composition, and how to determine chemical formulas from experimental data. Now first we're going to consider ionic bonds, which typically are formed between metals and nonmetals. And the difference between one of the differences between metals and nonmetals is that electrons are bound relatively weakly to metals and relatively strongly to nonmetals. So when a sodium and a chlorine atom come together, what happens is an electron is transferred from the sodium to the chlorine, and that forms a positively charged sodium ion, a cation, and a negatively charged chloride ion, or anion. And uh, the attractive interaction between these oppositely, oppositely charged ions helps to stabilize the ionic bond. There are lots of molecules uh, that form ionic bonds. These are just a few, but almost always they're formed between a metal on the left-hand side and a non-metal on the right-hand side. Similarly, we can form covalent bonds, but in this case we usually form covalent bonds between two atoms that have similar electron binding affinities, and usually they're nonmetals. And so if we take two chlorine atoms and bring them together, there's no preference of the electron for one or the other, and so it turns out that the electron cloud that's generated by both chlorine atoms is shared by both nuclei. There are attractive interactions between all of the electrons and both nuclei, and this attractive interaction action helps to stabilize the chemical bond. There are lots of uh, different kinds of molecules that can contain covalent bonds, but almost always they are bonds between elements that are nonmetals on the right-hand side of the periodic table. Now we can name ionic compounds, uh, and we'll start with simple binary compounds. Uh, sodium chloride, calcium fluoride, ca uh, calcium oxide are all named by naming the base name of the metal first, followed by the base name of the nonmetal, but then uh, changing the suffix from chlorine to chloride, fluorine to fluoride, oxygen to oxide. So the anion is indicated by the suffix ID. E. In the case of calcium fluoride, we need two negatively charged fluorine, uh, fluoride ions, each one with a negative one charge, uh, to balance the plus two charge in the calcium. We know calcium has to be plus two because it's in the second column of the periodic table. We know that fluoride must be minus one because it's in the next to last column of the periodic table. In the case of lithium oxide, we need two positively charged uh, lithium ions to balance the minus two negative charge of the oxide ion. Now some metals can have variable numbers of charges or oxidation state. Here are a few examples, and uh, FeCl2 is called iron 2 chloride to indicate that you need two uh, chlorine atoms or chloride ions to balance the plus two charge of iron. Uh, iron 3 chloride needs three chlorine uh, chloride ions. Some molecules have molecular anions. For example, potassium nitrate has an NO3- anion, which is made up of all nonmetals, but as a group, uh, this NO3 or nitrate ion has a charge of minus one. Calcium hydroxide needs two negatively charged hydroxide ions, each with a negative charge of minus one, uh, to balance the plus two charge in calcium. And sodium sulfate has two positively charged uh, sodium ions to balance the negative two charge in a sulfate anion, SO4 two minus anion. Ammonium perchlorate is unusual because both the cation and the anion are made up of groups of nonmetals. So NH4 plus, in this case, is balanced uh, by a single negative charge from ClO4 minus. Ammonium ion, perchlorate anion. Now covalent compounds are typically molecular compounds which are formed with covalent bonds and there are typically many many ways of putting these together. And so uh, we form nitrogen dioxide and we indicate that uh, there are two oxygen atoms and one nitrogen atom by the prefix dioxide. Uh, similarly N2O5 is called dinitrogen pentoxide and pent tells us that there are five oxygen atoms in this compound. Tetraphosphorus decaoxide has four phosphorus atoms and ten oxygen atoms. Uh, 
Now let's talk about chemical composition and formulas, and we're going to start by talking about composition by mass. We'll do this by example by asking, what is the mass of copper contained in 5.3 grams of copper sulfate? Well, we're after the mass of copper in grams, and this has to be less than 5.3 because it's only a portion of copper sulfate. And since copper and sulfate have roughly equal masses, uh, we'll guess that this is maybe around 2 grams. The strategy for solving this problem is uh, that we could calculate the mass of copper if we knew the moles of copper. Um, so we should first try to calculate the moles of copper sulfate and then relate that to the moles of copper. Well, the molar mass of copper sulfate is 159.2 grams per mole, and so we can calculate the number of moles of copper by dividing the mass by the molar mass, and we get 3.32 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of copper sulfate. Now that must be equal to the moles of copper because there's only one copper atom per uh, molecule of copper sulfate. And so the mass of copper is going to be the number of moles of copper times the molar mass of copper, which is 63.55 grams per mole from the periodic table. And that's 2.11 grams, which is close to our initial estimate. So we can have confidence that this is right. Now we can ask, what is the um, mass percent composition of a compound. And for example, we can ask what is the mass percent composition of iodine in nitrogen triiodide? Well, nitrogen is relatively light and tr and iodine is relatively heavy, and there are three of the uh, there are three iodine atoms for each nitrogen atom. So w the answer is going to be less than 100%, but it's going to be high. It's going to be maybe around 90%. So like the previous problem, we can uh, solve this problem using molar masses, but uh, since there's no specific mass given, we're free to choose any convenient quantity to start, and a convenient quantity is one mole. And so uh, knowing the molar masses of iodine and nitrogen triiodide, we can calculate that in one mole of this compound, we have uh, the mass of three uh, moles of iodine atoms, which is uh, 380.7 grams, and the, the molar mass of nitrogen triiodide is 394.71, and so the mass percent composition of iodine is going to be 380.7 divided by 394.71 times 100 percent, which is 96.5 percent. So that's similar to our initial guess, and we can have confidence that this is right. Lastly, let's take a look at empirical formulas, and we can ask what's the empirical formula of a hydrocarbon that contains 81.71% carbon? Now the answer to this question is going to be a formula, CNHM, uh, where N and M are small integers, and M should be roughly twice uh, larger, twice the size of N, but perhaps not exactly twice. And the strategy is going to be uh, to calculate the relative, relative number of moles of carbon and hydrogen and use that to construct the empirical formula. Now we're free to choose any size sample that we want, and so we choose a 100 gram sample as a convenient arbitrary starting point. The mass of carbon in 100 grams is going to be 81.7 percent of 100 grams, or 81.71 grams. All the rest has to be hydrogen, so the mass of hydrogen is 18.29 grams. We can now calculate the moles of carbon from the molar mass of carbon to be 6.8 moles in this 100 gram sample, and the moles of hydrogen similarly is going to be 18.14 moles in this 100 gram sample. So the relative number of moles of hydrogen and carbon is going to be 18.14 divided by 6.8, which is 2.667 to 1. Now what we're after is integers, and you'll recognize that 2.667 is kind of like 2 and 2 thirds. And so if we multiply both the numerator and the denominator by 3, then we get small integers 8 and 3. So the empirical formula for this compound is C3H8. We can recognize that as the empirical formula formula of propane, which is real hydrocarbon, and so we can have confidence that this uh, answer is indeed correct. Next time we'll talk about balancing chemical equations, simple equations like H2 uh, and O2 giving water, and some more complicated examples. We'll see you then.